We've been in the series of messages last few weeks on the conversations with Jesus, and we're looking at uh, the different uh, encounters that Jesus had with various people, and and uh, and seeing what that means in our own life, and and how we can encounter Jesus in similar ways, and uh, and grow as his followers. Um, this one that I picked today is a little bit odd because it starts out kind of not really a conversation, and so it. You have to hang with it for a while before the dialogue kicks in. You know, it's kind of like, in a way, like a bad movie. But um, in John uh, chapter 9, uh, as Jesus went along, he saw a man born, uh, a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither of this man or his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so the work of God could be displayed in his life. As long as it's day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night's coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. And so the man went and washed and came home seeing his neighbors and those who'd formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed he was. Others said, no, 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 no. he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I, I'm the man. It's me. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man that they were called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes, he told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know. So Lord, teach us from your word, teach us from this uh, encounter, and, uh, and help us to see you more clearly. And help us to move beyond the shadows in our own lives. That's our need today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well... I'm captivated by uh, these encounters that Jesus has because they, they happen in a context. They don't just, uh, uh, it, it, if we started right there, it seems like Jesus is walking along and he sees this guy and just stops and, and they have a little theological discussion about the nature of sin and uh, uh, payback uh, for sin and things like that. But um, if you were to go a chapter early and kind of ramp up to this, it's a, it's a real interesting uh, and, and pretty disturbing chapter because basically uh, Jesus is in this uh, ongoing debate with the religious folks uh, in which they're challenging his, his authority and why do you say that and why are you the way you are. And have you ever been in a, like a performance review where they, they've already decided that you're no good? Uh, you know, and, and, uh, and so you're... You're wanting to say, but look at the things that have happened. Look at the good. And, and they're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, ba 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 And so it, it seemed like this is what was going on with Jesus because every, every discussion, um, the minds were made up and it was really just, Jesus, why don't you just admit that you're, you're a loser and you're a fraud and uh, all these things. And, uh, and so... Uh, out of this context, and in the midst of that, Jesus has that uh, famous uh, declaration, you know, I'm the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. And they go, yeah, that's what you say, you know, blah, 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 and they wouldn't hear it. It's kind of like that song, I remember, uh, uh, I can't make you love me if you won't. You know, remember that one? It's a really cool song. I can't make you love me if you want. If you're determined to shut me out and to push me away, I can't make you love me. And, and that's kind of what Jesus was finding himself in. And so then, in, out of that context, he's walking along and, uh, uh, and sees this guy on the side of the road who's been blind uh, since birth and... Um, and it's interesting that the disciples don't seem to have much compassion. They're not saying, hey, Jesus, let's stop and do something here. This would be a great chance for you to help somebody. It's, now we want to know, you know, really where the guilt is here. Who's responsible for this? Him? Maybe his sin? Uh, 
born in sin, or maybe, or maybe it's his parents. Maybe he's being punished uh, to get back at the parents because they messed up. Everybody's parents messed up, you know, including my son's parents. They they messed up really bad. But um, the, and and Jesus goes, neither. I'm not getting into that. This is just so God's glory can be shown. This is just an opportunity for for God to abound and. Uh, and I've thought about that in my own life because, you know, I'm a negative guy. I'm a, I'm a confirmed pessimist, you know. And uh, uh, Jake and I are kind of the opposite, you know, or <laughs> different characters. But, but the thing is that um, I've often, often thought about this. If I were to take the issues and problems that I focus on, you know, a lot in, in life and see it as an opportunity for God's grace to abound, that would change my whole perspective. That would change my whole way of looking at things and dealing with people. Uh, not saying I will yet, but I'm thinking about it. You know, it's, a, it's getting to me. And this is an opportunity for God to show his glory. And, and isn't that what we have all the time in our lives that are usually problems? It's an opportunity for God to show his glory in the midst of this. And so, so Jesus stops and uh, doesn't even ask the guy what he wants. You know, there's other healings that where Jesus says, you know, what do you want? And it's like, isn't it obvious? Look at me, you know. Um, but he doesn't ask. He doesn't even seem to talk to the person at all. He just starts spitting on the ground and stirring up the dirt and putting it on the guy's eyes. And, and he didn't, that guy didn't see it coming either. It was like, <laughs> and, uh, and then, and then says, okay, go down to this pool and, uh, and, and wash it off. Now, if you've, uh, if you've been to the Holy Land, you actually can uh, visit the place on the road where they say, you know, this might have taken place. And then you can take the walk down to uh, the pool. And it's a rugged walk. It's a, it's not an easy pathway, and it's tough for those of us who can see. And you can imagine a blind guy stumbling along with junk on his eyes, you know, going, "Okay." So, but he goes and does this and wipes, it, you know, washes it off and can see, and then goes home. Doesn't go back to Jesus. Just goes home. I love that. It's so ordinary. You know, it's just the opposite of like TV evangelists and healers on TV and so where it's a big show and it's a, it's impressive and you build it all up and the people's faith. If you don't have the faith, you don't get the healing and, and you know, all that stuff. And this is pretty ordinary. This is pretty much, okay, here's some mud, go wash it off. Okay, wash it off, go home. And then the neighbors don't recognize him. Isn't that weird? Nah, that's not him. That's not him. It looks like him. You know, it looks like him, but not really him, which tells me well, one thing, and that is that a lot of time we don't even notice people around us, particularly people that we determine aren't important in our lives, so we don't focus on them, and we don't actually really know what they look like. They probably walked by this guy a hundred times, and... and Maybe even said hi, maybe dropped some coins in his cup, whatever it was, but they never really noticed him. So now they're having a debate on whether it's the same guy or not. Isn't that weird? And, uh, and then they come and ask him, you know, so how'd this happen? And I love his answer. This guy that they called Jesus... He's not calling him Jesus. You know, this, they said his name was Jesus. Uh, he spit on the ground. He made some money, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to the pool. I went to the pool. I washed it off, and I could see. Well, how did that happen? I don't know. Where is he? I don't know. I love that. That's the way God works, I think. It's so that we can't say, oh, man, you know, we really did this one right. <laughs> it's, it's um, I don't know. And in fact, one of the things that uh, here uh, in uh, Harvard Church, you know, a little startup, we're getting going, you know, one of the things that uh, your new elders are talking about is, uh, I guess I could let you know, um, we're thinking of, of sometimes doing some healing services after after church, you know, after the worship time, and anybody who wants prayer for emotional or physical or relational or spiritual healing, uh, come on up and the elders will anoint you with oil and pray for you and um, and it's going to be very ordinary. That's the thing. It's not going to be a lot of hoopla. It's going to be, well, this is what uh, the Bible tells us to do, so let's do it. And let's, let's let God be God. 
And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. We're going to do that in the next few weeks. But um, this, the ordinariness really, really strikes me. Now, I want to uh, talk about this in the light of um, Jesus saying, I'm the light of the world, which he does in, in 8, and then he also does it again um, in, um, in chapter 9. He brings it up again. And um, throughout Scripture, this idea of... of it was started, starting with Genesis, you know, in the beginning, you know, uh, and God said, let there be light, and uh, there was light, and that was one of the major acts of creation, and um, in Isaiah, it said, the people who dwelled in darkness have seen a great light, and then that, that verse that we always read at Christmas Eve, you know, uh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, uh, but we're the people who dwell in, in darkness. Uh, we're the people who, who are in the shadows. Um, and, and it's to us that, that God's light is breaking through. And um, now I, you know, for me, growing up as a child in, in West Africa, I, had, uh, I have an incredible, <laughs> now as a, a, an old adult, I have a, still a huge fear of the dark. It's the weirdest thing, you know. And because it actually was scary back then, okay? There was, there was stuff out there, you know? <laughs> and uh, it's not, I'm not just making it up. There really was stuff. And, but, but I carry that with me my whole life. I, I, I am just not good in the dark. And uh, I think I told you one time, um, Eileen and I, we have this pact that for every night of camping out now, uh, she gets 370, 3,742 nights in a Marriott on the, uh, on the uh, upper level, you know, <laughs> concierge level. So we did that one night of camping. So we were camping, we were driving up Northern California years ago when we were first married, and I was looking forward to experiencing camping with my new wife. And um, I mean, the only wife, you know, not the new one, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> new to me, you know. And, uh, and so we'd never done camping before, and uh, so it was getting this dark, and, uh, and, uh, and so we pulled off the side of the road, and I found this little space, and I pitched the tent in the dark, and it was struggling, and uh, we got in it, and uh, go to sleep, and about two in the morning, I woke up screaming, get your face out of our tent! Get out of our tent! And Eileen goes, uh, were you dreaming or did you see something? I don't know. Well, at that point, you know, she's not going back to sleep. You know? <laughs> and I go, wait, where's the axe? It's outside the tent. Should I go out there and get the axe in case we need it? Uh, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you, you go if you want. You know? And this was a time there was, and, and, and for those of you who are really old, you might remember there was a, a guy named the Sickle Slayer that was in the media that was going through Northern California and raiding campgrounds and killing people with a sickle in their tents. And so we're going, Eileen's going, this is what you got me into. You brought me here for the Sickle Slayer. You know, we'll never get to our first anniversary. You know, and, uh, and so um, I can't go out and get the axe. And, I, and then we hear it. People, footsteps coming up around the tent and then the quiet and then we hear the footsteps come around the tent all night long around the tent we were terrified <laughs> finally morning came and I got up and opened the tent and I had pitched the tent right next to the outhouse <laughs> And so all these campers were coming up the trail to use the facilities, and they run into our tent, and they walk around it. And one guy may have stuck his head in. I, I don't know. <laughs> you know. I told him to get out of here. Uh, anyway, and then they then they use the facilities, and then they come back, and there's our tent again, and they walk around it again all night long. <laughs> This is what happens when you're dwelling in darkness, right? I needed to see a great light. It was different in, the, in light. When the light was there and the daylight came and I could see, I would go, well, why would I have ever done this? And that's how we feel sometimes when we, we get involved in things in our life and we go, well, I, if I would have seen, if I would have known, I never would have done this, right? So we're still going to the Marriott. I'll never get that debt paid. But um, now, Jesus also not only said, I'm the light of the world, he also said, I think Matthew, um, 
You are the light of the world. Talking to his followers. You are the light of the world. I said, you know, a, a city, uh, you know, you don't cover up the light. You don't, you, you let your light shine. A, and, and that's defining our, our witness that, that we're, we're to be a light in our neighborhood. Funky as the neighborhood is, you know, uh, uh, we, we need to be reflecting God's love and grace. Now, anybody here really old that you remember the, uh, the dance halls that had those ball things, you know, that would circle around, they hit them with a light and the, the mirror balls. In. Is anybody old enough to remember a disco ball? Okay, all right. Now, the thing I love about this church, by the way, is that this was never built to be a church. This was built to be a dance hall here. And uh, this was the underneath this carpet, there's hardwood floors, and under the hardwood floors are springs. So you can dance all night long and not get shin splints or hurt yourself or anything. And the band, you know, uh, Dave Clark Five, you know. Paul Revere and the Raiders could play up here. And, uh, and so th this was a dance hall. And I've always wondered, if you look up there in the ceiling, that square. See that square? I couldn't figure that out. All the last few years we've been in this church, why in the world would the church people do that? That's where they hung the disco ball. <laughs> There's a little plug-in up there in the attic next to that, so you can plug in the disco ball and it turns and you hit it with a light. Isn't that perfect for a church? <laughs> that is so perfect because Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You reflect God's grace and God's glory and God's love and God's power all over the place. And every one of the little mirrors on the ball will shoot the light differently. It'll go in different directions and different strengths and different ways, just like all of us, right? We should be called the church of the disco ball. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You know, for you video folk, I'm just, just teasing. <laughs> but the thing is, that's the image that, that Jesus gives us about this. So going back to this, this encounter with this person. So um, he says, I don't know, I don't know where, where Jesus is. And then they brought him to the Pharisees. Uh, and, uh, and the day in which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked how he'd received his sight. Here's his answer. He put mud in my eyes, and I watched, and now I see. I love that testimony. Isn't that great? And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. He, do he doesn't keep the Sabbath. And others said, how can a sinner do miraculous signs? And they were divided. And finally, they turned again. He said, what have you to say about him? It, it was your eyes that were opened. The man said, He's a prophet. They still couldn't believe it. Uh, and then they called his parents in. You know, you parents are always going to be called in. <laughs> Not just, you know, when, when little Johnny's in trouble for his mouth at school. You're going to get called in all the time. Anyway, so the parents come in and said, is this your son? Uh, was he born blind? Well, how is it that he can see now? And he goes, well, we know he's our son, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. And so this goes on and on. The most powerful witness, I think, that we can do, that we can share with the people at work, our neighbors, school, the most powerful witness is not being able to answer all of their questions about the Bible or about God or finding all the right words to say. The, the most powerful witness that we could possibly have is, uh, well, here's what God did in me. This is what happened to me. Uh, this is my life. Here's where I was heading. And Jesus got a hold of me and... This is what he did. If we could share that, we'd be big time evangelists. Because no one can, can refute that. 
No, it, you don't get caught up in all the arguments that the religious folk are having here. You know, this reminds me of so many church council meetings I've been to. You know, and not here, of course. I'm talking about other churches, you know. But um, the thing is, you know, people want to debate things. They want to get into, and really it's all about control. When really, if we just said, well, here's, here's my life and here's what Jesus has done. I don't know anything else. That is powerful. That is so powerful. Anyway, the, he goes on, he gets in a little argument with the people and, uh, and gets thrown out. Um, uh, and they threw him out, it says in verse 34. So Jesus hears about that he'd been thrown out and he goes and finds him. Now here's where the conversation starts, at the very end of the story. Isn't that interesting? Um, goes and finds him and says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he? The man asked. Tell me so I can believe in him. And Jesus said, well, now you've seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking to you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. I, I love that the, the honesty of this story in John 9, it's not that Jesus goes up to some stranger and says, I'm the son of man. Do you believe in me? And they go, yes. And they become a follower. You know, that's how I was taught in Sunday school. Uh, kind of a miracle. But it's in the context of, I don't know. This is what happened. I don't know. I can't explain it. My parents can't explain it. We don't know. Neighbors aren't even sure what's going on. All of that, then he gets thrown out, and Jesus comes and finds him and says, okay, let me, let me tell you a little more. Here's, here's what's happened. So you not only can see, but you can also see spiritually too. And you can understand uh, who I am and, and how God's brought me here to you. And then the response is, from I don't know, to, well, maybe he's a prophet, to I believe. Lord, I believe. And worship. That's the journey we all need to take, don't we? Over and over again. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, you know. I remember we were traveling through uh, Uzbekistan once with some guys, and, and uh, one of them uh, who actually spoke Kazakh and Russian uh, found this big mosque and, and started to go in the mosque. And they said, I'm sorry, you can't come in here unless you're uh, Muslim. And the guy said, well, uh, Muslims honor God with their whole lives, as we do. And we follow the prophet Jesus. Well, come in, Muslims from the West. And they welcomed us, and they fed us, and they brought us to their Amman. And they, uh, we had a wonderful day with them in the gardens. The children were all there because we were welcomed as the Muslims from the West who followed Jesus, you know. Maybe that was sneaky. I don't, you know. <laughs> Notice I didn't say I said it. I, didn't, I wasn't that smart. But, but it was interesting how the perception changed. They loved Jesus the prophet. But it's not the whole thing. It's not uh, God in the flesh. Right? So, so we come to the point of belief. Now, How do we live the implications of this conversation? What's it mean to us? First of all, I think, you know, I look at my own life and I think, how many ways have I hunkered down in the dark, you know, and just settled in it? Um, I get comfortable in, in the shadows. Um, and, and you notice if, if you've been in, uh, maybe late at night, uh, somebody flips the light on, how, how do you react to that? Ah, oh, the love, wonderful light. No, no, it's like, oh, no, turn that off. Wow. Uh, that's why cops always shine the flashlight in your face, you know. I mean, not that I would know that, but, you know, I've read about it, you know. But, uh, you know, they shine it in your face because it's, it's, it throws you off. It's, it's blind. And, and sometimes when Jesus moves towards us and we're, we're hunkered down in our little shadow world yeah, and Jesus moves towards us, sometimes we're repelled by that. We go, oh, this isn't comfortable. I, I don't know if I want the light of the world in, in my life. 
but it transforms us when we allow the light of the world to shine on us and then to reflect out. Now, today we're going to have communion together as we do on the uh, first Sunday of every month. And this is a special Sunday, actually, because the first Sunday of October every year is Worldwide Communion Sunday, which means that followers of Jesus all over the world and in big churches and homes and uh, everywhere are of all different denominations are meeting and, and breaking bread and sharing the cup today, just like we are. So we join in that uh, globally. But I, I want you to be thinking as you take the bread, dip it in the cup and, and take it, that, that you're allowing the light of the world, you're allowing Christ's light to, to come over you. And I want you to picture that, that the light is coming over you and you don't have to hide in the shadows anymore. And it's okay to say, you know, I, there's a lot I don't know, there's a lot I don't understand, but I'm going to take Jesus at his word. I'm going to take his body broken for me and his blood shed for me. And I may get to the point where I can say, Lord, I believe. You may not be there yet, but that's okay. Trust, trust him as much as you can for where you are now and let him show you who he is. He's not done with that conversation with any of us.